Good afternoon, everyone. As we're waiting for people to log on, if you'll just get comfortable, we'll start in a little bit around five more minutes. Um, you can put any questions that you might have in the chat um, or raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to answer them if you have any questions before we get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Kuntz, and it's my pleasure to serve as the State Archivist for North Carolina. And I wanna welcome you here to the meeting today, the short corporation meeting for the Friends of the Archives followed by our program. Um, we're gonna give it just another minute as people are coming in. I can see the numbers rolling in and going up quickly as people are joining. So I wanna give people a chance to get situated. But as we're getting settled, I would um, say that all participants are automatically on mute with your video off. Um, we encourage you when we get to the question and answer portion of the program to share your questions in chat or um, share them along the way if you have, have something that you'd like to share uh, during the, the corporation meeting portion and we'll be monitoring those chats. Um, I would encourage you also as we're getting started, the website for the friends is up on the screen here. If you, it's now is the time for renewal or joining. If you 
um, would like to join us, we would love to have you as a member of the Friends. And if, if it's annual renewal time for you, those letters will be in the mail and we encourage you, you can also join online as well. Um, as we start our meeting today, we are gonna be doing a couple of short votes of the, of the body by a poll feature. Um, and I will kick off that poll, but when we're getting ready to call for the vote, um, I would encourage some of our members who are in the audience to, if you'd like to move or second, put that in chat so we can sort of be official here with our meeting. Um, and we do appreciate your patience as we convert to a different system than we normally do when we're sharing in the auditorium all together. Um, I do see a number of names on our attendee list that I really wish I could be with you in person to greet you, but I'm glad you could join us virtually today. Let's see if we give them maybe another minute, Karen, and then you can start. We're close to close to 100 here, so let's hopefully give people a chance to get started. And I would encourage everyone to remember that when the corporation meeting is over, which again, that's fairly short, don't leave because then the program starts. So we'll go from one thing to the next. Well, here's our agenda for today, and I'm going to turn it over to our president, Karen Parr, for her to go ahead and run the corporation meeting portion of today. Hey, thank you, Sarah, very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Karen Parr, as uh, Sarah has said, and I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, our first order of business is to approve the, me the minutes from our June 17th, 2019 meeting. And I believe, are those minutes being shared in the chat? And um, I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> okay, thank you. Once we've got those in the chat, uh, we'll ask for a motion and a second for, and then launch our poll to approve them. Actually, um, I can't share my screen and share the minutes at the same time, I just realized. Um, okay. Were they mailed, they were emailed ahead? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so they were emailed ahead to our members. And so if we could please in the chat have a, a motion and a second for a vote on those. Thank you, Donna. I see a motion. Now we, may we please have a second? Okay, thank you, David and Bob. Okay, um, so now, uh, Sarah, if we could please launch the vote. Um, please vote to approve. Anytime you're ready, I can share the results. Okay, uh, now is a good time, thank you. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Now I'll give a brief report of um, our activities of the last year or so. Um, thank you, first of all, for this opportunity to serve as the Friends of the Archives president. Um, even during these challenging and unusual times, we have been able to continue the work of the Friends of the Archives to support the state archives and offer funding for some of the agency's activities that are not covered by state appropriations. For those of you who might not be familiar with what this includes, we pay for internships and special conservation projects. Uh, we fund the purchase of collections and also provide funding for staff training and other events. Before the pandemic arrived, the Friends of the Archives funded workshops held by the archives reference staff at the ACOC Birthplace Historic Site. Uh, the Friends also supported the State Library and State Archives sponsorship of the Spring Best Practices Exchange Conference by managing registrations and payments for this program that ultimately wound up having to move online because of the pandemic. Uh, the Friends itself had some public events planned and um, including a state archives open house and some fundraisers, but these also had to be postponed because of the pandemic. Still, we have made gains in some 
a couple of areas that will strengthen the organization's work in the future. Friends of the Archives board members, Rich Carney and Randon McRae, together with our wonderful staff member, Christine Bada, have created a new website for the Friends of the Archives that is attractive and also shares information about our work and programs. It gives information about how to join and provides opportunities to donate and also to purchase items that support the archives work. And uh, Sarah shared that link in the beginning, but it's um, archivesfriendsnc.org. Another really great initiative that you'll hear more about in a minute is that our treasurer, Frank King, did extensive research and found an option that will allow the Friends of the Archives funds to grow at a much higher rate than we were receiving in our bank accounts. Thanks to his leadership, we now have an endowment with the North Carolina Community Foundation. And not only does this option earn more returns on our, our organization's funds than we were receiving before, it's also placed us in an arena in which we can draw contributions from people who are looking to give money away. And we've already received one such donation um, just because we were in the North Carolina Community Foundation. So we're very excited about that and Frank will tell you more about it in a minute. The Friends of the Archives has some exciting initiatives planned for the future. We hope that we can go ahead and hold those in-person events that we had planned and had to cancel because of the pandemic or postpone because of the pandemic. But we're also looking for ways to bring more younger people into our organization. So watch for more information about that soon. Um, for those of you who are members, um, we ask you to please uh, renew your membership and, and stay involved in the Friends. For those who have joined us today to hear our fellow board member and friend, Dr. Warren Miltier talk about his book, please consider joining. The work of the State Archives is important to us all in North Carolina for the work it does to preserve and share our history and to strengthen our democracy. And now I'd like to thank my fellow board members and officers who I've served with in the past year. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Secretary Susie Hamilton and Deputy Secretary Kevin Cherry uh, for their service in an ex officio role and always enjoy hearing from them. Um, I'd like to thank Bob Moss, who was vice president, Sarah as, as Kuntz as secretary, and Frank King as treasurer, and then uh, past president, Joanne Williford. Um, our members at large who've done a lot of great things for us are uh, Joshua Hager and Randon McRae. And then we have our, our great group of folks who are serving more like three-year terms. And those people include Jennifer Doherty, Joe Mobley, George Thomas, Jason Tomberlin, Rich Carney, Victoria Young and Warren Miltier Jr. You'll hear from in a little bit. So um, thank you all and I've enjoyed working with you and look forward to working with you more in the future as your past president. Now, Frank, I'd like to turn it over to you please for the financial report. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Friends of Archives has, have two deposit accounts, one with PNC for the checking account, and in that deposit account is about $14,000 in a general fund that is unrestricted. As you can see in the top portion of the slide, we also have about $13,000 in our checking account that is what I call temporarily restricted. People have granted, granted us the money for a specific purpose. Our second deposit account is with Live Oak Bank. And it, it, it totals a little over $20,000. And about half of it, $10,000, is in an unrestricted account. And about $10,000 is in a temporarily restricted account for an acquisition, uh, thanks to Mr. Stevenson. Uh, next slide, please. As Karen alluded to, uh, this spring, after COVID hit and the stock market crashed, we were fortunate to have CDs maturing and we invested about 50% of, the, of, the, uh, of our endowment, which was a little over $110,000 in about May 1st into the North Carolina Community Foundation, which is an endowment that has over 1,300 members or uh, accounts here in Raleigh. And then in August, early August, we invested the remaining balance still with the stock market somewhat down. 
So we have invested a little over $226,000. Since that time, the stock market has done well and our account has done well. And uh, I think the timing was in the circumstances were great. Uh, so I am happy to report that we are in good financial situation. We're trying to endow our four components, which uh, is Yandel Preservation, Baker Interns, Jones Staff Development, and anybody that likes would like to become a life member, it is put in through the endowment and the, and the income is distributed per, per the board discretion. Also like to take this opportunity for anybody that would like to ensure that the friends of archives remains in perpetuity, that's a hard word for me to say, uh, will gladly take your donation, send it to Friends of Archives and just for any amount and just put endowment down there and it will end up in our endowment and uh, last past all our lifetimes. And lastly, I'd like to thank Christine Boda for her assistance during the past 12 months. Uh, and, and keeping our records in, in good financial shape. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frank. Our next, um, our next um, thing is to thank all of our wonderful volunteers who have who've done so much to help um, further the work of the archives in a volunteer capacity. Um, these are people who are working all over the state to, to help in all kinds of um, work, as you can see on the screen. And I just would like to quickly recognize at the Outer Banks History Center, Emily Hamulka, Digital Access Branch, we have Leanne Brewer, who's helped. Um, in the Public Services Branch, we have Andy Poole, and he's also helped with the military collection in the special collection section. Um, in the special collection section, we have Caitlin Moore, um, government records, um, Michaela Johnson Davis has helped. Outreach and development, uh, Danny Sharilla. And then in the oral histories of special collections, we have Annie Anderson and Julia Kane. Finally, in the military collection, um, again, Andy Poole, but also Kat Jackson and Madison Bray. Um, these are wonderful volunteers and they've done so much um, to further the work of the state archives. Thank you again. And then uh, moving on, we're ready to vote for our, our candidates for next year. And um, like to present the slate of uh, Rich Carney for president, uh, Bob Moss again as vice president, uh, Frank and Sarah will remain in their roles as treasurer and secretary. And then um, Jennifer's agreed to come back for another three year term and uh, will be joined by, um, assuming we elect them, um, uh, June Power and Marcellus Joyner for um, the members who will be here from 2021 to 2023. And so now, Sarah, if you could please uh, present the poll. Allow people to vote. Uh, whenever you have, uh, looks like you have a critical mass of votes, Sarah, please okay. tally the results. Wonderful. So um, they're elected unanimously and uh, we'd like to thank all those people for their willingness to serve. Um, again, I think there's some great things ahead for the Friends of the Archives and we look forward to having them on board. Um, now, uh, for my last um, uh, point of uh, the meeting today, I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Again, uh, if someone could make the motion in the chat, we'd appreciate it. We'll take a second and then we'll vote quickly on that get on to our speaker. Thank you, Victoria and Rich. Okay, in the vote, please.
And again, whenever you're ready, you can just tally that. Okay. Well, thank you so much and I appreciate your attention. And now we'll move on to the program. Oops, All right. Okay, very good. All right, well, I wanna take a moment too to thank um, our, our board members and especially Karen and Frank and everyone who's been um, working so hard on Friends activities this year and to Rich and Randon for the website redesign. It's really been, been great. And we appreciate all your efforts and your flexibility as we've adapted to the new environment in 2021. So thank you all for the, the short meeting there and we will move on to our program and I'm gonna introduce um, our moderator and our speaker and remind everyone that you can put questions in chat. Um, I think they're gonna have a few things to discuss but we do encourage your questions and we'll try to draw our attention to the questions as, as they're done with their, um, their portion. So today we are joined by Joe Beatty and Dr. Warren Miltier. So uh, Dr. Beatty uh, is the research supervisor for the historical research office in the Office of Archives and History. And he works with a team of historians and editors to share our state's history through the North Carolina Historical Review, scholarly monographs, and the Highway Historical Marker Program. The office also publishes a roster of North Carolina Civil War soldiers and digital editions of the governor's papers and colonial records. Joe previously worked as the colonial records editor and currently serves on the board of the Carolina Charter Corporation. Before coming to our department, he worked as a historian at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and he received his BA from James Madison University and his doctorate in early American history at the University of Florida with a concentration in slavery and religion in the Atlantic world. And joining him today is Dr. Warren Eugene Miltier Jr., also a member of the Friends uh, Board. Uh, Dr. Miltier is an assistant professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He received his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2014. His publications include two scholarly books, um, Beyond Slavery's Shadow, Free People of Color in the South, that's gonna be coming out from UNC Press next year, and North Carolina's Free People of Color 1715 to 1885, recently published by LSU Press. He also has independently published Hertford County, North Carolina's Free People of Color, as well as articles for the Journal of Social History and North Carolina Historical Review. And in 2014 and 2016, he was the recipient of the Historical Society's RDW Connor Award for the best journal article in the North Carolina Historical Review. So welcome to you both. I'm going to stop sharing the slides here and let you take it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for that nice introduction, Sarah. Um, I wanna take a moment to, to thank Sarah and Karen and the Friends of the Archives for inviting me here to participate in this um, uh, and, and the chance to talk with Warren about this uh, really interesting book and a fascinating topic. Um, so I've prepared a few questions and as Sarah said, I uh, welcome your questions in the chat. I'm gonna, I have the chat window open. I'm gonna uh, keep an eye out and, and see what comes in um, and, and if, Somehow you have a question that's missing my attention, feel free to, to submit it again. Warren, did you want to say anything? Oh, yes, I wanted to uh, thank, thank everybody for the invitation to speak today. And I wanted to thank you too for serving as moderator. And I look forward to the conversation. Well, excellent. Well, I'm going to dive right in. Um, I guess the first thing, I'm just curious, uh, how did you come to study history? How did I come to study history? Wow. I mean, I've always had a fascination with history um, ever since I was a kid. I think as far as taking history seriously, probably grew out of my interest in my own family history. Um, started on my family history as a kid and kind of fell into the profession in a sense. Uh, doing research early on trying to you know learn about census records and things of that nature in order to build my family tree led me into looking at other types of records and here you go <laughs> that's a familiar story <laughs> that seventh grade uh social studies class where we had to do a family tree and then you know 20 years later you have a doctorate um so for anyone who doesn't have the book yet, and I should, you know, not pass up an opportunity to, to plug your book. Um, for anyone who doesn't have a, hasn't seen it yet, what are they going to find inside? 
So inside the book, um, you have a variety of different chapters that cover the period from the early 1700s until after the Civil War. The book is not completely chronological. There's some thematic chapters, some chapters that fit more of a chronological setup. Um, but I discuss topics varying from family life of free people of color to their experiences um, during the colonial period and the Civil War. Um, I discuss their legal status and the political debates around free people of color. Um, and that's primarily in the uh, post-revolutionary period. Um, I spent a lot of time discussing the situation or relationships between um, white people and free people of color at, a very, at the local level. So not just looking at those relationships as far as how they um, are seen through the law, but how they look in everyday life. Um, so those are some of the topics that I cover. That's, that's terrific. And, and I think we'll come back to this later. You do have a, a great, uh, when you cover legal history and social history and, and people defying boundaries. And I think I'd like to, as we get on, uh, um, ask you a little bit more about some of those in specific. Um, so how did you come to pursue this topic? So the, the topic, of course, goes back to what I was talking about earlier with my uh, interest in my family history. So many of my ancestors were free people of color. And so that's where I first learned about this topic. Um, and so in doing research on my family, I eventually ended up at the state archives and did a little bit of research there. And the research on my family ended up becoming something bigger because of course families are connected to communities. So you're trying to learn more about the community and you start to figure out, oh, this community in one county is connected to another community. And soon enough, I was just looking at uh, records from across the state. And um, eventually I figured out that I had enough material that I could end up writing something about free people of color. And so the first time I tried that was as an undergraduate, in undergraduate studies at uh, North Carolina State University. So I wrote an honors thesis there about free people of color in North Carolina. And in doing that, I got engaged not just with the uh, primary source materials, but also looked at some of the secondary literature. So I actually came to this topic from the primary sources first and not from the secondary literature, which is not always the case. Um, and then, yeah, I continued on from undergrad into grad school, looking deeper into the topic of free people of color. I was also doing a little bit of research on free people of color in Virginia as well as North Carolina. And um, when it came time to write my dissertation for my PhD, I eventually settled on the topic of free people of color in North Carolina. And uh, this book is derived from that research. That's terrific. Yeah, that's an interesting path to, to go from the primary sources into the secondary sources. Um, and, and it shows, I mean, it, we could, uh, I'm sure we'll probably get some questions about this later, but, um, you know, looking through your, your footnotes you must have done some real excavation in the archives. Um, uh, I think we had chatted briefly about this the other day, but um, I mean, I imagine you must have read entire counties worth of, of uh, court records to find some of the stuff that you did. Oh yeah, I mean, sometimes I joke with the archivist at the, the state archives about if something burned up in the archives, they could have backups at my house from all the copies that I made over the years. So, yeah, that's terrific. Um, just one last question before we sort of get into uh, maybe a little more into the book. Can can you tell a little bit about the you know, I heard this is a strange question, but I heard this the other day in an interview with a with an author, and it it something spoke to me. It said, uh, "Can you tell me a little bit about the intellectual community that helped support you in this project?" You know, I'm thinking 
you know, you have John Hope Franklin's earlier work, probably your friends and colleagues in graduate school and um, your colleagues. Can you speak a little bit to that? Right, yeah. Um, I work with a lot of different people, advisors, my undergraduate advisor at North Carolina State, Holly Brewer, uh, Phyllis Hunter at UNC Greensboro, where I got my master's. Um, and then for my PhD, my primary advisors were Kathleen Duvall and Linda Maynard Lowry. And so they really helped me. Um, I mean, first of all, just like figure out how to write this all and, you know, take these sources and uh, make something out of it. How do you format that? that? How do you, you know, make an, a historical argument out of all of these papers? Um, so they were really important. I mean, my colleagues, especially in graduate school, um, were helpful as well because they gave me a sense of like what other people thought was important about what I was finding. I mean, I've always, you know, thought, oh yeah, this is great. This is interesting. But to, you know, it's a process to learn how to convey that to other people and figure out exactly like what types of sources they find interesting, what particular aspects of the lives of free people of color mean something to them and maybe to the larger society. Um, so that was really important. And then as far as thinking about people outside of my direct circle, thinking about the literature, I'm very much in conversation with historians like John Hope Franklin that you mentioned, uh, Ira Berlin, sure. um, and um, Melvin Patrick Ely as well. There's some of the key scholars that I talk about in the introduction of my book and play a role in, and very much how I wrote the book because the book is um, in some way in response to the literature that they uh, had produced before. That's great. Um, an interesting thing about your title, and I appreciate this, is there's no there's no colon and there's no subtitle, which is a is an odd thing these days. I appreciate that you uh, you take a stand like this is what this book is about. And um, will you tell us um, what is a free person of color in North Carolina from 1715 to 1885. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's one of the major issues that I'm trying to deal with in this book. So I define free people of color um, as people who could have been either of African and or Native American descent um, who were free before 1865 or before the uh, end of the Civil War. And so you have a variety of different people who fit that definition, um, people of different appearances, different backgrounds as far as their uh, legal uh, rights, as far as their wealth status, um, who are in that group. But by the time we get to the Civil War, there are about 30,000 free people of color in North Carolina. Um, and from what I can tell, the vast majority of the free people of color by the time we get to the Civil War are people of, of, of mixed ancestry. So they have a variety of different backgrounds in their um, family histories. That's a, that's a significant number. Yes, definitely. Um, besides a couple of other states, uh, Virginia and Maryland, North Carolina had uh, the third largest population of free people of color in the South. And um, that was another reason that I decided for, to pursue this topic as far as a dissertation and thinking about it, you know, as a future book is that uh, it seemed like a, an important state that hadn't received as much attention recently. So um, John Hope Franklin had written his book about free people of color in North Carolina back in the 1940s. And other than a few articles, there had not been a significant look at the population as a whole. Uh, a couple of books had come out uh, about certain individuals who were free people of color in North Carolina. That was a great observation. Uh, um, in the introduction, you mentioned that, that free people of color in North Carolina had legal personhood. Um, what do you... What do you mean by that? Yeah, so that that point is something I bring up as, as far as 
um, this debate that I'm, I'm part of when it comes to discussing free people of color. So I make the argument that free people of color have legal personhood in the sense that they can uh, buy property in their own name, that they maintain control over their children, generally speaking. I mean, there's some exceptions to that. Um, that they can be sued and sue other people. Um, and that's in contrast to thinking about uh, the enslaved population. So these are things that enslaved people generally cannot do. And um, in the earlier scholarship, Ira Berlin, his, his book, Slaves Without Masters, makes the, the argument that free people of color were slaves without masters and that their status was just slightly above that of enslaved people. And so I'm trying to take um, my study in a slightly different direction and I'm arguing that free people of color had rights that were significantly, um, they had more rights than the enslaved population and that was significant. I'm trying to point out that how important that is and that in many ways their rights were more similar to those of white people than they were to uh, the enslaved population. And that's not to discount that free people of color were discriminated against. And I think I show evidence throughout the book that that's the case, mm -hmm. but there's a difference between being discriminated against and having the status of enslaved people. And I think it's important out of respect for the experiences of free people of color, but also the experiences of the enslaved population to make that distinction clear. And so that's what I try to do. Yeah, no, it, it really comes through. And, and I imagine that their, their legal status um, uh, affects how they appear in the historical record, how they show up in the state archives, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, turning back to the, the title again, just to think about that, um, the, you have the date range as 1715 to 1885. And you know that, that signals to me that there, there are free people of color in North Carolina, probably a little earlier than I might expect, and, or some people might expect, and, and even later than some people might expect. Can you, uh, you tell us a little bit about the the people who are on the um, the ends of that spectrum, and and um, and tell us a little bit about that that date range. I find that really interesting. Sure. So, some of the the, the um, issues with the title come from discussions with the press. So I should uh, mention that ahead of time. But as far as thinking about the early 1700s, I decided to go with that date because that's where we have the first. Um, clear records in the law about free people of color. And um, also you have a better source base by that time to be able to discuss that population. Um, and so free people of color, when we're thinking about the early 1700s, it, uh, they're a group largely made up of um, people of indigenous ancestry, um, children who are born to uh, white women who are of color, because being you could be free either as the child of a white woman or a native woman, and so many of that early group got their their uh, freedom that way. There are few enslaved people who become uh, manumitted during this time, but North Carolina law pretty early on tries to discourage that. Um, and so as a result, you don't have a large population from what I could find of former slaves who make up the population of free people of color in the 1700s. Um, there are also free people of color in other colonies coming into North Carolina, especially Virginia. They're moving south and settling in the uh, far eastern counties of the state or what or the colony at the time. Um, and then they gradually move west. And now as far as the, the other book end, um, so the 1885 part, um, I decided to go into the period after the Civil War briefly with this book. I think it's uh, a topic that has not been well explored in the earlier literature. So we know that after the Civil War, 1865, 
uh, the enslaved population is freed, You've got this population of free people of color, but it's not clear like how do free people of color and enslaved people interact after the war? How do free people of color see themselves um, in comparison to the enslaved population? So I try to explore that. And um, I think th th what I found was that free people of color took various positions when it came to their relationships with the former enslaved people. Some free people of color allied with them, uh, especially in politics, um, while other free people of color sought to distinguish themselves um, and continue on the patterns from the pre-Civil War period where they had a legal status that was higher than enslaved people. And although that would no longer exist in the post-war period, they try to use the, uh, or curb their social interactions in order to reproduce that in some way, that relationship. Yeah, it's interesting to see these people defining boundaries and kind of uh, pushing back against boundaries that either that they didn't uh, construct and trying to build new things. That's, that's really interesting. Um, and in 1885, there's the, the law, that, right, that uh, allows some people to shift from being the person of color to Indian, is that right? Right, yeah, so there, there's a recognition from the state of certain people who have been classified for a long time as free people of color as being Indian, and so that, all, that played into uh, why I decided to stop at that date. Um, but yeah, that is an important part of uh, building social boundaries, but also building like legal boundaries because that legal status allowed uh, those people who were, who self-defined as Indian to have their own schools, have their own institutions. And this was important because uh, after the Civil War, there was segregated schooling in North Carolina. And so it allowed a, basically a three-part system when it came to schooling in the state. Which is pretty wild. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there's more wild things that happen afterwards, but I didn't get into that. <laughs> well, here's, I'll ask you a question about that in a minute. Um, um, you know, obviously everyone here knows, uh, everyone here loves the archives, knows that you love the archives. So I'd like to ask you a little bit more about how the, the archives appear um, in the book. I mean, it's real, it's clear as we sort of mentioned a moment ago, you really excavated some of these records. Um, how in the archives did you find stories that were, well, I guess first, how did you find some of these great stories? how did you find stories that were new to you? Um, it was a long process. <laughs> um, keep digging right yeah basically you keep digging but i think when i originally started doing research in the state archives i was looking at um minute books uh, that was probably the key source and the minute books cover a lot of the um annual monthly go things that are happening in any particular county and as I explored those books, I learned how other records that the archives had were connected to those books. So there would be court cases, for instance, that were mentioned in a minute book. But if you wanted to learn more about the details of that court case, you needed to go to the loose records collections, which could include uh, the civil and criminal action papers. Um, there are also collections of records that are labeled slave records or free Negro records. And so those also expand into um, some provide some of the, the details that are not in the minute books. So um, from there, you you start getting into some of the, I would say maybe less used record types. Um, so road records, um, yeah, records of the poor house, um, th those kind of records where free people of color appear, but not in the same way that you might see them in a minute book. So in a minute book, um, 
records, things that you might find there would be like apprenticeship records. So that's something I talk about a lot in, um, in the book. And um, there are sometimes loose apprenticeship records that go with those entries, um, sometimes not. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I developed my uh, strategy. It was just a very hit or miss strategy. I did eventually start to focus on certain counties of interest. Um, some of them were counties of personal interest. Others were counties that I knew had large populations of free people of color and also um, significant records because those people who might who are familiar with the state archives will know that the records collections for every county are not equal. Um, floods, fires, and other things have uh, destroyed the records of many counties, while other counties have pretty intact collections. Um, that was a, a huge struggle, I think, sure. in, in working on this project is that some of the most important counties where there were large populations of free people of color uh, were also counties that suffered significant uh, damage in the past, their court records, uh, the courthouses may have burned, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's always tough. And the different uh, counties administered their courts a little differently, right? You might, something that might appear in a minute book in one place might not elsewhere. And um, I imagine that's, that's an unexpected hurdle that appears. Right, yeah, and that's something I actually uh, have a section at the end of the book kind of talking, kind of explaining uh, the sources. And I, I did that because I knew that people who might be familiar with the records in one state might suspect that the state records in North Carolina operate in the same way. Right. And I wanted to explain like, no, they don't actually, <laughs> um, that there's a lot of inconsistency in the records. Uh, and it, over time, even within one county, you can see a lot of inconsistency. And so it's important to convey that to people as they're asking questions about maybe why don't you have statistics about uh, one issue or another? And that is part of my explanation for why those things don't exist. Right. And not all clerks are created equal, right? You know, no, what, what is important yeah. to write down to one is not necessarily to another. Absolutely. Um, we've gotten a couple questions. So let me um, veer off here for, for a second and, and ask, um, one of the Q and A's we got, it said, uh, it's from Larry Tice who asks, could you say more about your use of the term radical and radicalism in the book? Since most people in North Carolina were perhaps pro-slavery, how were radical pro-slavery folks radical? Um, did you become radical if you simply expressed your opinion on slavery publicly? That's, that's uh, an excellent question. Um, so, I'm, the way I'm using the term radical pro-slavery is to distinguish those pro-slavery people who um, were willing to go the extra length to show that they were uh, enthusiastic about slavery. So those are the people I consider radical and amongst the radicals are people who I, I see constantly spending a lot of their time targeting free people of color. Because from what I can tell, some, you have pro-slavery people who see free people of color as a serious threat, or they're trying to make that argument that they're a serious threat. And there are other people who kind of just accept the existence of free people of color. They do business with free people of color. Uh, they may be neighbors of free people of color and still pro-slavery. So they don't believe in um, that enslaved people should be equal and that slavery should end, but they don't necessarily believe that free people of color should share the status of slaves. And the radical people seem to be going more in the opposite direction. So they're always uh, advocating for laws and advocating for ideas that limit 
or destroy the legal rights of free people of color, therefore pushing them closer to the status of slaves. They're the people who want to create a close association with race and freedom status. So they want all people of color to be slaves in some sense, if not in a real sense. There are people by the time we get into the 1850s and 1860s who are advocating for the enslavement of free people of color. That's right. Or, or their exile, right? Right, yeah, they want them to either leave the state and go somewhere else, which is hard to do because other states don't want them, right. um, or they want to enslave them. And those people are people I would argue is radical. And part of the, another reason for that is ultimately those plans to enslave free people of color, they end up in the leg legislature, but they don't end up being uh, law. They're not policy because they're rejected. Um, some pro-slavery people, even, uh, you know, I, people I would argue are not uh, friends to free people of color in any sense, still see a threat in trying to enslave uh, free people of color. They see that as a, a, the next step to enslaving other groups of free people and so they argue that that's unconstitutional and can't be done. Um, and ultimately the, the most extreme or most radical members of the North Carolina General Assembly lose um, in their effort to enslave free people of color. That's great, thanks. There was a, another question in the chat. Um, did you find much in church records? Were some denominations more welcoming to free people of color and their families? So I, I can't say much about the different denominations and their uh, friendliness, other than to say that um, the Quakers were probably uh, the most friendly, if we want to use that, that term or that way of thinking. Uh, there were Quakers who volunteered to educate free people of color, um, but at the same time, uh, free people of color in, in most cases that I've seen can't join the Quaker church either. Um, whereas they can become Baptist, they can become Methodist, Episcopalians, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I did use church records um, somewhat to highlight the connections between free people of color and the white population as well as the enslaved population. So you do see some churches where free people of color, whites and slaves are all in the same church. Um, Sometimes the churches would have um, a split organization in the way that they ran their affairs. So there would be a group of free people of color and enslaved people who would work together to deal with the affairs of people of color. And then there would be uh, the, a group of white men primarily who uh, dealt with the affairs of white people and the church as a whole. Sure. Um, another question from the chat is, uh, to what extent did the archives include the actual voices of North Carolina's free people of color? Did they, for example, publish letters in abolitionist newspapers or to what extent do you hear their voices? Um, they're, they're limited, very limited. Uh, I think as far as in the, the state archives, finding their voices, you see them primarily in two places, in petitions. Um, so free people of color petition local courts, the state legislature for a variety of different things. Uh, the state In the state legislature, they're petitioning often for the freedom of family members. So they, you have a free person of color who has an enslaved husband or wife, uh, enslaved children, and they're petitioning, asking the legislature to give them the right to free those people. Um, they're sometimes pushing back against attempts to take away their rights. And so you'll see petitions there in their voice. Um, at the local level, you may see similar types of petitions. Also, you would see um, instances where free people of color's voices show up in court cases. So most court cases in the uh, civil action and criminal action records don't have testimony but occasionally you do see testimony um, in especially murder cases 
And so hmm. you'll, you'll see the voices of free people of color there, but they don't show up as much as I would like to see them. Um, another area that I should also mention is newspapers. So occasionally you'll find the voices of free people of color in the newspapers, but it's more uh, from the angle of them trying to advertise their businesses. Um, so you'll see free people of color who are maybe barbers telling the general public um, about their skills and the different services they offer at their barber shop. Uh, those are the, the most common places. Finding letters uh, from free people of color are, are very, very difficult. I'd imagine that some people have those things still in their personal possession, but it's harder to get them to the archives. If you know somebody who has them and uh, they might get destroyed soon, I think you should take them to the archives. That's that would right. be my recommendation. <laughs> Please do that. Are there, are there any oral histories of um, folks from North Carolina? Um, so there are a few oral histories that exist from like the, the early 20th century. Um, a few of them are mixed up in the WPA narratives, right. slave narratives, uh, where instead of uh, interviewing an enslaved person, a free person of color ended up being interviewed. Um, there are also a few collections at Howard University that uh, include interviews from free people of color who were still alive, say, in the 1930s. Um, so they would have been teenagers, young adults before the war. Um, keep getting, we getting, getting some great questions here in the chat. Um, let me ask uh, this one here. Um, can you speak briefly on the impact of uh, the Nat Turner rebellion on free people of color. Um, Van says that uh, someone recently shared evidence that people suspected of involvement in the Turner revolt fled Virginia to come to North Carolina and settled, you know, in places specifically where they, well, uh, specifically in Orange County where Okanichi people had settled. Do you find anything about that? Uh, I haven't seen anything about that specific example. Um, you do find th a few sources that discuss the rebellion as far in relation to free people of color um, being jailed temporarily as suspect because there's a lot of fear right. after the rebellion and uh, it just ripples throughout the, the especially the northeastern counties that are closest to Southampton County, Virginia. Um, and there are individuals who kind of take advantage of that opportunity, or they see it as an opportunity right. to kind of harass free people of color. They harass the enslaved population as well. Um, so that's, that's what I'm familiar with. That I think the one thing I can say about the Turner Rebellion is in North Carolina, at least, is that there have been arguments in the past that suggest that the Turner Rebellion was a major change is created a major change in the social dynamics of the state. And I think at the time there definitely was, uh, there are examples of change, but long-term, I don't know if it made the, the, the change that um, others may have assumed before, but there's definitely an impact. The, the state legislature passes laws that limit the freedoms of free people of color after sure. the rebellion, which, makes them look good because they have to do something um, right. to, to curb the rights of somebody. And free people of color are always a convenient target when it comes to curbing somebody's rights. So they go there. Yeah. Um, as you look through these different uh, sources, did you, uh, Tell us about some a great surprise that you found, or was something that you came across that was uh, totally unexpected. Hmm. Well, I, I've been dealing with those records for so long that nothing seems unexpected <laughs> now. But um, maybe something that would be of interest to people. Um, I discussed in the book uh, voting and the fact that in 1835 free men of color lost their voting rights. Some people may be shocked that they had the right to vote at any time, 
but they did up to 1835. And there are some of these survive, there's some of the surviving uh, voter lists in the North Carolina State Archives. And so you can see the names of the free people of color who voted in 1800, 1835, right before the disfranchisement took place. Um, of course, you need to know who the free people of color are ahead of time in order to be able to look at those lists and actually recognize the significance of them uh, for this particular history. But I thought that th those records were uh, particularly fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the received narrative is that nobody, you know, the, the franchise was so restricted, even for white people, how could we even imagine that a free person of color could vote? That's a, that is an amazing find. That's very cool. Um, we got another question here, um, also about some movement of people. Sorry, I keep moving these. I, I lost it. There it is. Um, did uh, so another question from Larry, did many of the free people of color from the, the pre-war world who migrated northward, did they come back during reconstruction? Do you see any evidence of that kind of return migration and, and how were they then viewed um, after they returned? Um, I can think of a couple of examples right off the top of my head of people who had moved to say Ohio and then came back after the war um, some of them come back to join their families in old communities. Um, there are a few people who end up getting involved in politics and see um, the end of the Civil War as a great opportunity to um, build on their political ambitions. And so that's uh, one thing that I found. Um, I don't know if it's, it's really, really common that that happens. Um, but it, yeah, it did happen in certain areas for sure. Um, there's, a, there's a question here and I think it sort of attaches to another question that, that I had. The, the question um, from the chat is, can you share about the racial categorization process for free people of color? Um, the question asked particularly the role of memory and cognitive processes. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, the different categories in that span the book? Okay, yeah, that, I think that, that question deals with the book's first chapter. And so in the first chapter of the book, I'm trying to explain how all of these different people could be looked at as members of a single group or fall under a single category because you have people of different uh, physical appearances. So different hair textures, different skin colors. Um, some people who today we might perceive as white or um, who are considered in their communities, free people of color. And so I, what I try to do is explain how Communities use uh, memories of ancestors. Um, they use those physical features at, combined as a way to figure out who is who um, and just make a distinction between those people who are free people of color and have certain rights or not as many rights as those people who might be considered white. And then getting into the issue of memory, I discuss memory also more in conjunction with freedom status, because in the colonial period, the state and local communities had not really developed a way to distinguish who was free and who was enslaved. And over time, we see the issuance of freedom papers that document that or manumission records that document the freedom of free people of color. And in doing that, they often have to go back to the ancestry again of certain individuals. Who is your mother? So you're tracing freedom through the mother's line and they want to know um, that that person was free and why that person was free, how they were free. 
And so that requires community members to come together and explain to a justice of the peace or a clerk that this individual is free because I knew this person's grandmother and this person's grandmother was free. And so therefore this person is free. And so I try to go into detail in analyzing that because we've known for a long time that uh, being born to a free mother was a source of uh, liberty for free people of color. But I'm trying to go a step deeper and explain why that was important, how it worked in the everyday community. Um, because there are all these laws that discuss both race and freedom status. Um, and they suggest that this is a very precise product process. And I'm trying to show that it's a bit more convoluted. Well, right. And, and without the, the kind of record um, identification and record keeping system that we are accustomed to today, that's a real community process, what you're describing, you know, people testifying on the behalf of their friends and neighbors and family members about their status and relation. Absolutely. Um, the, the question about the 715 came in. Um, how does 715 re relate or does it have any relation to the end of the Tuscarora War? Uh, for this book, that wasn't where I was coming from. No, I wasn't coming from. It was more about um, the laws, the earliest laws that I could find. So apparently North Carolina had other laws that existed before 1715 that probably would have dealt with free people of color. Um, but as far as I know, unless somebody has found something that I'm not aware of, uh, we don't have a clear sense of what the status of free people of color was before that. And so that's why I, I stuck with the 1715. That was, that was the main reason. Yeah, that period is real interesting where the, the law is trying to catch up with what's happening on the ground, you know, it's, we have free people, what's their status? The law is trying to define this. And, and uh, you know, in other places like Virginia, for example, the, um, the law is constantly, you know, even into the 1720s, um, the law is constantly in flux as they're trying to like close loopholes that allowed people to assert their freedom um, where uh, the, the law in Virginia at least changes maybe in, in similar to 1885 here where, um, you know, they sort of create or embrace new categories of, of identity to try to control people um, that the legislature does. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. It, part of what I see in here is you're always talking about um, there are these contested spaces. Um, what did free people of color do to assert their their personhood, to assert um, their place in society, especially as that became increasingly um, well under attack or, or maybe fragile? Well, I think maybe the the most obvious thing that they tried to do was to uh, find the loopholes in the law. So when a restriction came about they would either follow the law to the best of their ability or they would ignore the laws and challenge those laws in that way. Um, I think an example that comes to mind were the restrictions on guns. So the North Carolina uh, legislature follows other states and requires uh, free people of color to have a license in order to carry a gun or Bowie knife or other weapons. And so some free people of color go to the courts do what is required and get a license that way. But there are a lot of free people of color who never go to the courts and um, they just keep carrying their guns, keep them in their house. Um, I mean, if you think about it, they need the, the guns to hunt, to provide food for their families. Uh, going to a court to get a license takes time, requires money, uh, requires somebody to stand before the court and say that you're a good person and that you deserve a gun gives the clerk the right to do that. And some people are just not willing to go through all of that process. Um, occasionally they're prosecuted for that, um, but other times they're not, or they're prosecuted and the charges are dropped. Everybody knows they have a gun, but 
at the end of the day, they also realize that these people need uh, these weapons just to, to stay alive. And so they, they resist in that manner, I think. Um, liquor is something else that is restricted. The being able to sell liquor, you see people who continue to, you know, bootleg liquor, or in, uh, even though they're no longer allowed to sell liquor. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of small resistance that's taking place. Well, and that's practical. I mean, you're almost obligated to bootleg liquor in, in North Carolina, <laughs> the requirement. Um, another good question here is, a, a, and we have a, Sarah says we're, we're doing all right on time, but I want to, um, we should probably start rolling toward the last uh, few questions. Um, a good question. What proof was required to validate a person's status as they moved from uh, one state to another? Was that validated? How or and if so, how was it validated? I think the most common way that people would have validated their status was they would go to the court and have the local court and have the local court issue them free papers. And so the free papers uh, would describe that person's uh, physical characteristics might explain how that person became free. So they were born free or were uh, manumitted and maybe give some testimony about their character. And so they would use those documents as a way to protect themselves as they moved, especially people who would move north uh, would get those documents. Um, if you're moving within your own community, it's not really a big deal. Most of, you know, most North Carolina localities are relatively small, especially compared to today. Everybody knows everybody or somebody in your community knows you, even if you move to a different neighborhood. Um, but yeah, if you're going to a county that's 100 miles away or you're going to a different state, free papers are the uh, way that most people document their status. The, the court is issuing those. Yes, the court issues the, the free papers. And, and that's an interesting situation going back to what we were talking about when it comes to records. So some counties occasionally make note that they issued free papers to people, but most of them don't. And the only reason that I know that these papers were issued is because people's family members today still have them. Wow. And so you realize, oh, okay, this county was doing this. Or what would happen is they would get to another state and have those uh, documents recorded there. So in Ohio, there were books that registered free people of color. And you'll see in those books, all of these notations of uh, for people who had come from North Carolina and moved to Ohio. Right. That's another way you find stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, you have to go to other states to find it. <laughs> you have to it. look at other people's archives. <laughs> um, Carol had a question here about um, that in the, the colonial records, there are petitions that people make against uh, the, the tax that free householders had to pay on their family members. Right. Um, do you find any of those in other kinds of records or in... Um, yeah, do, do you see examples of those? Um, I think there are a few cases of like more individual resistance to the tax laws. So in the county court minutes, I think occasionally, or in some of the loose paper collections like the criminal action papers, you will see where an individual was prosecuted for not paying a tax on his wife um, or some other dependent. And so those sometimes correspond with this larger movement to um, resist this discriminatory tax. And the discriminatory tax wasn't just in North Carolina. Virginia had a similar tax and free people of color there resisted maybe actually more effectively. The tax was overturned in, in Virginia during the colonial period. Um, and you would have larger groups of people who would get together and just not pay the taxes on their, their wives and other women in their households. There's a, um, there's a question in chat that I, I in the Q&A that I think um, 
really speaks to your expertise on this, and I don't know that, that you can answer it. I'll, I'll read it to you, and maybe there's an opportunity to follow up okay. uh, later. But um, the question is, my from the from Tony Lewis, my free people of color relatives migrated from North Carolina to Georgia. The matriarch was native to North Carolina, resided in Georgia since the age of 13. Um, and asking asking for help, so you know I think your your expertise is in is in high uh, demand here. Um, let me ask you one let me ask you uh, another question and I always it's always fun to ask historians this um, what didn't make it into the book? Oh wow! What didn't make? I mean, it is there is there one thing, where you, you know, because there's always that one thing where, like, I was trying to find a place to put this to put this story in here, and I just couldn't find it. But I'd love to tell about it. Do you have any of those? Right. Yeah. There, there are boxes and boxes of documents that didn't make it into the book. Um, let me think of what's something specific that didn't make it into the book. I mean, there are a lot of court cases, interesting court cases that I came upon that didn't make it into the book, just didn't fit, didn't make sense, but may have had very fascinating testimony, especially like some of these murder cases are, are really fascinating in the, the way that people are covering up evidence or some of the testimony about certain individuals and their character and you know whether how terrible they were or how great they were and being able to see like the personality come out in the records that's that's something that I could think of that didn't make it into the book, but there, there was plenty of it. Um, now, obviously, I, I don't want you to to give away all your secrets. Everyone should go out and buy a copy of the book and read it and enjoy it. But um, what's one or two things that you really want folks to take away from from the book? Well, I think I want people to uh, look at free people of color as an important group that says a lot about the, the significance of freedom in our society or how freedom can be contested in our society. So that's, that's something I think that we really need to look at more. And I also want people to see free people of color in their own space um, when we're thinking about literature, when we're thinking about analysis, um, for so long, I think free people of color end up lumped together with the enslaved population. And I think there are maybe some reasons for that, maybe some of them good, some of them maybe not so good. But I think they also deserve study on their own, expanded study on their own. Um, there is a lot of research that's going on about free people of color outside of the United States and probably a little bit less about free people of color in the United States. But in order to draw connections to the way that freedom and race worked globally, I think that we need to take free people of color as a collective in the South and North Carolina uh, more seriously and look at their, their status uh, legal status, look at how they uh, created family life, community life, business life, um, and what that tells us about the way that um, the law both created opportunity for them, how they created opportunity for themselves, but also how their experiences were limited and what that can tell us about limits to freedom in our own time. Well, you, you've done great work here showing us the, the different uh, layers of this experience over time, a, a great span of time that shows the, the ups and downs and the, the real struggles of, of people and some of their triumphs too. Uh, it's great stuff. Thank you. I appreciate so it. So my, my last question, um, the next time we see you in the archives reading room, which the arts, the archives are Reading room is uh, reopening on a limited basis, appointment only. Check the website for more details. Um, but the next time we see you in the archives reading room, um, what are you going to be looking for? 
Um, I'll be juggling probably too many projects at one time. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things I still want to look at in some of the colonial record collections. And then probably on the other the end of that, probably collections closer to the Civil War period and maybe a little bit after. There's some questions I still have there that I'd like to figure out the answers to. Well, that's terrific. Well, I look forward to, to seeing you there once, uh, once we're all better able to get in. Yes, I'm looking forward to getting back into the archives. We look forward to having everyone back, <laughs> even if it's on a limited basis and with lim restricted seats. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe and Warren. I really appreciated that. That was a, a great uh, discussion. Thank and you. I do encourage everyone who um, is in the audience, if you haven't gotten the book, do, do get a hold of the copy. You really tell some, I think, rich stories. I appreciated the way you took, you know, government records can be a little bit dry and wove them into some nice narratives and stories um, up on all those topics that you mentioned. And just talked about the diversity of relationships and family relationships and relationships with neighbors and communities. And I think that was, that was really great. And Thank you. I encourage people with family history interests to take a look too, in case you're related to any of the people that he is um, uh, mentioning in the book. So um, it's a great resource. And we look forward to the next book. I, I take it you're gonna be setting up free people of color in a larger setting in, in the South, not just North Carolina. Right, right. Okay, good. Because that was one of my questions that how we related to, you know, um, other states in terms of their restrictions on, on free people of color. So we'll, we'll wait for, for book two. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And I get one more plug for joining the Friends of the Archives. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you sometime soon in the search room. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.